Hello, and welcome to Victorious Living Christian Counseling Podcast. My name is Crystal Ridlin, and I am a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Indiana and in the state of Missouri. Today, we have a very special episode for you. Um, it's a, extremely special for me because I have one of my most admired counselors in the field of counseling, biblical counseling, on our pod, on my podcast today as a guest. And her name is June Hunt. She's a world-renowned biblical counselor, author, speaker, and the founder and CSO, Chief Servant Officer of Hope for the Heart. She also has a a radio program that she's really famous for called Hope for the Night, where she counsels people on air. And it is broadcasted all over the world. You can find the link at June. What's the, where's the... Uh, the website hope, hope for the heart.org yep hope and you can find the, all of the different radio stations that broadcast it i was actually listening to it last night and um so i admired you hunt because i met her when i was just a student a, a master student getting my counseling program and i met her at the um the aacc conference american association of christian counseling conference and her heart is what stood out to me first and foremost Um, Her expertise is astounding, um, and I've learned so much, but her heart for God and her love for people was just something that I connected with right away. Um, She is godly. She loves people. She's wise. She's very loving. In fact, I want to be like June when I grow up. (laughs) So June, can you kind of say hello? Well, I'm delighted to be with you, and I can just assure you, I never planned to do anything that I'm doing, and um, this is what happens when you yield your will to the will of the Lord. He already knows what he plans. In fact, Jeremiah 29, 11 is just very special to me. It's a scripture that says, I know the plans I have for you, and this is God speaking. God is one saying, I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I didn't, I wasn't raised with scripture. I knew nothing about the Bible and uh, never heard of having a personal relationship with God through Christ. So I can just tell you what the Lord taught me. Uh, I needed, um, because I grew up in a very difficult home environment and Uh, I know what it's like to have questions, but there are no apparent answers. I mean, I I didn't have answers. So Crystal, it means a great deal to me that you also uh, had a tough, very terrible uh, background and upbringing. And um, so, you know, we can't choose what our past is in terms of what we had uh, growing up, uh, but we can choose what we do today. And that's why we desperately need truth. Uh, We need God's truth to set us free. And uh, when we begin to learn, oh, there are principles. Oh, there are things that, hmm, um, you know, I, I, I didn't know this. Well, that's great. The Lord is the one he, he counsels us in the way we should go. And uh, the spirit of Christ, when we become authentic Christians, then the spirit of Christ lives in us. And the Bible says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, he's going to do something inside and he changes us inside out. Um, and we just need to cooperate so that even if we don't agree, if God said it, we've just got to say, we've got to say, you know, um, I don't understand it, but I'm willing, I'm willing to try. I'm willing to change. And he's faithful to do that because he loves us. And um, we don't at times know that some people never even heard that God really, really loves you. That's, it's just some ethereal language there, but it's absolutely. I remember, um, this is something I didn't tell you, but when I was about 14, a Mormon, you know, some Mormon missionaries, some cute guys came to my door. And at this point I was living in just awful 
um, abuse and was looking for any kind of hope. So I ended up going to the Mormon church for about a year and a half. And um, I remember some, my piano teacher who actually gave me free piano lessons because she was trying to pray me out of the Mormon church. She told me <laughs> later, <laughs> but um, she was a blessing. And um, she's the one who invited me to church the first time. And I remember walking in <clears throat> to the Baptist church and I actually sing, and that's how she got me to come to church. She said that her youth group needed a strong vocalist and that was my weak spot. So <laughs> I ended up going to church to sing. Um, but when I walked in, it was the first time I felt love. I didn't know what it was. Wow. I was just like, this is a, this is crazy. What is this that I feel there was a peace. Um, there was like a calm that I felt the moment I stepped into the church. And then that evening I went back and accepted Christ huh. <laughs> and that um. became my hope before I didn't have anything. I didn't have an anchor that, you know, I actually have my little sign up here. Hope anchors the soul Hebrews six yeah. nineteen. I didn't have that hope. And I remember I'd be up praying all night and my brother was like in the room next to me and he'd be like, would you be quiet and go to sleep? <laughs> She called me this holy roller, <laughs> but that was how I would, I got through, um, just because I, I didn't change the dynamic right away. I had to still live in a broken home, <clears throat> but I had an anchor. And so that's what, um, we're going to talk about today, domestic violence and how that has a profound impact on the victims and how can we give hope and, um, healing to people who are stuck in a, in domestic violence situations. Um, so domestic violence and spiritual abuse is the topic for today. And, um, a lot of the material that we're going to talk about, you can also find in June's book, how to rise above abuse. And here is the book. If you want to see it. Um, so we're going to start out with June. What is domestic violence? It's not good. <laughs> no, it's awful. <laughs> um, domestic would indicate it has to do with your home environment. The violence part is uh, we have to realize some people assume violence is you have to have slashes and all these bruises all over. Uh, it is any forceful act used to intimidate, uh, to uh, sometimes undermine, to control another person. And, um, you know, to, to be very candid, there was a point at which, I'm just popping in here. My mom worked, walked on eggshells. In fact, we all walked on eggshells. And, I remember uh, there was a, one time for a period of time, I asked, I said, mother, I would like for you to meet with a counselor, someone I know personally. And she was willing to do it because her sense of value was so low. And I, I, I hurt for her in that way, but anything I would say, she would excuse as though you're just prejudiced. You're, you know, sensitive. Yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're not seeing really you know, because you say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm dumb, and I'm, I'm thinking, good night. This is not true. And so, uh, I had her meet with this wonderful woman I knew, and uh, in my home, I would leave my, leave them in my bedroom, and I never asked anything. After my mom went to be with the Lord, I. I had a man who uh, was my, let's see, father's nephew. He came to, to me to ask about some cancer thing. Would I, would I be a part of a family counts, uh, you know, sh share my story of, of cancer? And I said, I'd be happy to. And then at the door, he said, you know that your father used to spend nights at our house or sleep on a church pew. And the, uh, and I, my dad said Christianity is a crutch and he was very much against Christianity 
And so I thought, sleep on a church pew. I said, no, I've never, never heard that. And he said, yes, your dad's dad would beat his wife, your grandmother, and the kids would run. And sometimes they would make it to our house or they would maybe only make it to sleep on a church pew. I said, I've never heard that. Now, Crystal, I thought, what do I remember my dad ever saying about his dad? I couldn't think of one thing. That's almost unheard of. And I went to my brother and two sisters individually. What do you remember dad saying about his dad? And we all said nothing. We, we, can't, we can't think of anything. And I, I remember one time asking my dad, well, how was your day or something? He said, never ask me that question. He blew up and, you know, and I felt like an egg splashed against the wall, you know, just kind of slithering down. And um, I couldn't get him to, well, I didn't try much, but I knew he just, he just wouldn't talk about the past. And I've learned this. If somebody kind of is dysfunctional, they're, they're, they're not doing well in their lives. If they are absolutely silent about either a mother or a father, go there, go there. Why? Why do they not speak at all? Dads um, are very important in this way. Sons love to talk about what their dad said or what their dads did or what they did together. All these things, that's classic. And my point is, if there's a total absence of anything about either parent, ask, what was it like for you? growing up um, with your dad or with your mom? What was your relationship like? Because so many things are formed in those formative years where we are powerless. We don't have choices. And I know what it's like to have no choice. Being shut down, we, we were not allowed to speak at dinner and we were not allowed, I was not allowed to have any contact with my mother from dinner on. I was told I was a bad influence on my mother. And that was it. And there, everything was just one way. And he was double her age. And it was a messy, messy relationship anyway, because uh, he had three families going on at the same time. He had multiple wives and uh, not not being a Mormon. I don't mean that. But uh, it, uh, it was just very, very hard. And we were the third family. So I grew up with this fictitious last name. So I wasn't transparent at all. I probably needed to come to you, Crystal, to help me <laughs> get out, you know, to, to be able to talk. But that's the, the important thing is that truth sets us free. And you help people deal with truth, to get the truth out, and then to evaluate, but is it really true, true? Yes, it Things are accurate at times with what we experience, but that doesn't mean that the messages we have been given about ourselves or the way we've been treated, the, there's, there can be huge impact. And uh, you know that personally. And that's why I think you're an excellent counselor. Well, sometimes people look at me and they're like, I've been to 10 counselors and you're the first one who gets it. Uh-huh. And why is that? I think it's one, because I've been there. I've experienced a lot of heartache. I've experienced a lot of difficulty, but I've also been in a position where I allowed God to use counselors mm -hmm. and I've had EMDR, eye movement desensitization therapy for several years to overcome it. And sometimes I still have a trigger. Like um, after my grandmother passed away in January, it was really hard. She was my, um, she was the only safe place I had as a child. She was wow. the only safe attachment I had mm -hmm. when I was young and she had been in a nursing home and it already kind of felt like I lost her. So, um, all I had asked God is let me be with her when she dies. And, um, so I got a call that morning 
And my dad said, who I don't really talk to, um, he's never been around much in the picture. The only reason I've, I've talked to him recently is because of her. And um, he said, you know, they put her on hospice and he's like, she could be around for another month. It's not imminent. And the, and the Holy Spirit said, go, just go. Good. Good. I called the nurse. The nurse said the same thing. They're like, she's been eating. She's fine. And I, I talked to my husband. He's like, just go. And I was able to be with her. She died one hour to the minute after I arrived at the um, nursing home. And um, she had made peace with God. She had been very broken from a lot of different things. She lost, I think, five kids um, that had been born. And she had nine pregnancies, four miscarriages, five that lived only three that made it to adulthood. And then the only one left was my dad before she passed. She had a lot of brokenness that she had like pushed down for a long time, but her and I were very connected. So she was my attachment figure growing up. And so I, I texted one of my counseling friends and I'm like, why do I feel like I can't move or do anything or like do laundry? And she's like, walking through grief like this is like walking through semen. It's just hard. Um, so I don't even know how I got on the topic of my grandmother. I forgot, but, um, uh, <laughs> there you have it. My but, but grandmother no, was my safe talking person. About the, you know, the, the pain of not having any choices and, but you, that you hit something very significant when you said she was your safe place. I think we need to pray at times, God, um, would you guide me to someone that is wise, someone who is, uh, who cares. And um, I had one person who I didn't actually talk to, I didn't share, but I, but she cared. I could, I knew she cared. And uh, I later learned she kept trying to get me to talk, but I couldn't get things out. But I, I remember thinking, but if I were to tell someone I could tell her and she would understand. Just knowing that was huge because mm -hmm. I, I felt like I had a cork in my throat. Nobody had my situation. Um, you know, it was very messy. My uh, having multiple, my dad having multiple wives at the same time. It just, you know, and they were covert. Everything was hidden. and But yet uh, he was very narcissistic and never you know never was wrong about anything supposedly my dad so uh right. i didn't know how to handle uh life well i just but when i got exposed for the first time to authentic christianity it was like oh my goodness i i i i, I uh, thought is this real i've never seen anything like it there were teenagers that you know, high school students that knew the Bible and they had whatever it was. I, I wanted what they had because, but I didn't know, well, I thought, well, they have all this information. I don't have anything about, I don't know. I don't know any scripture. Well, they didn't have just information. They had transformation, but I didn't know about that. They were changed by the Lord inside out. And so it took me six months to think I, I think this is real <laughs> and so but but uh, I I did go to um, a, a church camp I didn't know what church camp was I thought it, you just do tricks on people so I brought some itching powder I thought well that'd be kind of fun well that wasn't exactly the Christian camp part that I, but it was great uh, you know uh, just again hadn't been exposed and so then my Sunday school teacher, who was the first one who I taught in power. I mean, it was just phenomenal how she taught. And I couldn't wait for Sundays. I began to live for Sundays, but I couldn't verbalize anything. And so, uh, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you this. The second time I was in Sunday school at a biblically based church, uh, they passed out a uh, test and they, they had something called high school Bible. And it was mid, it was like in January. So they'd already had the Old Testament for the 
three months and then now you know so they pass out this test and i i look at this thing and all these i, I know nothing so i you know so asked if I could speak to the teacher. I said, I don't know. She said, that's okay. Just just look through it, through the questions. And if there's any one that you think you might know, that's fine. And all of a sudden, Crystal, there was one I thought, I think I've heard this. What are the four gospels? I, I think I've heard that somewhere. And I thought, da, 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 I just, <laughs> I, it's like, you know, and uh, so I did answer. I put down Matthew, Martin, Luther King. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm sincere. I promise. But I did get the Matthew right. <laughs> so so it was close. <laughs> yeah. I but that shows you how absolutely ignorant I was, and I wouldn't even know. You know, I didn't know the word gospel meant good news, the good news about jesus and he's god and he comes to earth and he isn't just a wonderful teacher but he knew we would blow it we would sin the bible says all we like sheep have gone astray each one of us has turned to his own way uh, and and so yes we've all sinned and the bible also says that our sin separates us from god well well i can't change we can't change what we've done wrong and but if we don't want to be separated that's the whole why of jesus jesus who is god took on human form came to earth and he he said you don't take my life from me i give my life as a ransom for many and that's so powerful literally died on the cross sacrificing his life he because he was perfect he's the only one who would pay the penalty because we can't pay the penalty for ourselves because we are we have, we are sinners we have chosen wrong we've chosen to be defiant at times and so that's what um, he did for us so that if and here's the big if if we would humble our hearts and receive jesus as our personal lord and savior giving him control of our lives he would forgive us of all of our sin. And see, I knew nothing about that. I, I didn't know the language. I didn't know, I didn't know, understand uh, the point of the Bible. Of course, I didn't know any Bible anyway. So, uh, because when you're ignorant, you are so ignorant, and at least I was. And yet, I realize many people who listened to us, that that's where they are. They weren't exposed either. And oh, do I have get to get easily that? intimidated by the Bible. And so when I, I'm like, I was too, like, I remember not being able to find anything in the Bible and still I didn't grow up, you know, singing the new Testament, old Testament songs. Uh -huh. And so still, when I get into the old Testament, I have to sometimes go to the table of contents. Right. And right. there's no shame in that because that's where I'm at. And, um, well, but yeah. the Bible is all marked up because it's like my sword. Um, and I tell people, let's just start here. Let's start with, I always have them start with James because I think James is just such a powerful, I've always said, if I was in a plane crash, I know this is really weird. If I'm in a plane crash and my entire Bible is gone and I can only have one page, I would want it to be James chapter one. Cause I think it's just such a powerful <laughs> chapter. And so I start people there I'm like, let's just, cause usually they're in a place where they're really hurting. And when it says count it all joy, when you face trials of many kinds and explain, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that, you know, it's that we are going to literally be happy when we're going through difficult times. It means that through Jesus, we can have a deeper joy, um, a contentment in the midst of the trial. I actually have, um, the, the title of my practice is a victorious living Christian counseling, but God gave me this title when I was a student and I was sitting on the beach at Jekyll Island and the kids were all taking naps. So my husband was with them and it was just me. Mm -hmm. And God said, he really kind of just revealed everything to me right there. And so I went back and I told my husband the whole story and he's just been pushing it. Like he's been encouraging me. 
So God said the title of your, um, your business is going to be victorious living counseling because not all of us are going to have a pain-free life. In fact, people like you are going to be abused. There's going to be people who've sinned their entire life and they need a message of hope that no matter where you're at, when you come to Jesus, that through him, everything that we've done, all the sins we've committed, all the brokenness from our past can actually be presented to him and made victorious. Can he turns our, he turns the, the difficult into beauty, right? Like mm-hmm. Romans eight twenty eight, all things work for good to those who love the Lord. I had a guy come to me one time and he would not mind me sharing because he actually would like post it all over Facebook and he would tag victorious living counseling and say, there's no shame in getting help. Like amazing man. Um, he lived a very sinful lifestyle for pretty much 50 years. And he was in the checkout lane of life. He had everything ready to take his life. And a, a medical doctor told this man, you need to get your life right. You have one month or I'm going to intervene. He's like, you need to find, you need to go to a church. You need to open your Bible. (laughs) This this medical doctor could have lost his license for what he did, right? Like he could have lost his job. And so um, he's like, and you need to find a counselor. So right about the time the guy had one week before he was going to go see this doctor and he called me and I answered the phone, which I usually don't answer the phone because I screen calls because I've gotten weird stuff. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And so, um, but I answered and he kind of told me a little bit and God said, you need to get him in your office. And, um, so anyway, he came in I, it was a long story. He actually had contacted one of the more popular Christian counselors in town who I knew some things about. <laughs> I didn't have a great experience. I had PTSD for a year. I saw her and she never told me, Oh, wow. I, I had to diagnose myself as a student. That was interesting. So I ended up like getting a new counselor and that was great. So anyway, he's like, I called this person. I'm like, and I know this person doesn't call people back. And I knew he didn't have time. I'm like, look, I will give you a discount, whatever it takes. Like, but I don't want to push you, but I'm going to send you my link to my website. And then you can let me know. And he opened it up within five minutes. He said, sign me up. So he came in, he was June. The guy was gray. I thought he was dying. He literally was dying, but it was like, it was so weird. He was great. And I started just showing him that I like God's love. And I said, victorious living, this is the motto. Victorious living is not only a dream, but a real possibility through Jesus Christ. You may have made all kinds of mistakes growing up, but there, you made those decisions because you were hurt and didn't know what to do, but you're in a place now where you can heal. You can spend, if you live, I mean, at this moment, I didn't think the guy was going to live another couple of weeks. So I'm like, you, if you live a day, if you live a week, if you live two months, you can surrender to Jesus. The guy ended up accepting Christ the second or third time I saw him and, um, amazing. He's now ministering to the people that he was sinning with before. He's just like a whole life transformation. He came back the next session after he accepted Christ. He had told me he hadn't read the Bible because he felt so unworthy. Oh, wow. I said to him, um, after he accepted Christ, I opened up a Bible that didn't look like a Bible and I had him read John three 16. I'm like, can you read this? And he read it. And I said, you just read God's word. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you tricked me. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> And, um, and he just started crying. He's like, I wasn't, I didn't get hit by lightning. And, um, anyway, oh. this guy is just real special, but, um, that's the whole idea is that that's why I do what I do is I want people to see that none of us are going to have a perfect life. The Bible says in this world, you will have trouble. It doesn't say you may, or you possibly could. It says you're going to have trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, but take heart because Christ has overcome the world and he can overcome all of those places. Like he's done in my past and in your past. Doesn't mean that occasionally I don't still get triggered. My sister sent me a, a nice doozy of a Facebook message <laughs> about a month ago, Whoa. literally triggered me. I ended up doing EMDR on myself because I couldn't sleep. When I met with my counselor, I'm like, I'm doing great. She's like, how I'm like, 
I just did EMDR on myself. It was really hard, um, but I felt better. And she's like, well, I think you're doing good. So that's kind of the the practice that God's put on my heart. And sounds like we have different names and different practices, but we have the same calling Mm -hmm. is to help people who are hurting find victory and hope in Jesus. You've mentioned something that was a challenge to me. I had a hard time even understanding what I was reading in the Bible because I did see everybody brought a Bible. And so I got a Bible and, uh, and I had one, meaning it was on a shelf and um, it was um, the King James language. And I had a hard time understanding it, um, but I was, um, it just was phrased differently. And then someone said, June, go to James, go to the book of James. It's only got five chapters, only five chapters. Okay, maybe I can handle that. I'm so <laughs> stunned that you're saying this. And then the practice, see, James is the, I say it this way, it's the proverb, Proverbs of the New Testament. Proverbs in the Old Testament, they have all these nuggets of wisdom and, and, and uh, they're, it's fascinating. And some people, because it's 31 chapters they'll do it for 31 days every month they'll just go whatever the day of the month is they'll read that one chapter and that's a wonderful practice many people do that but also uh just the james part i thought okay i could maybe make it through five chapters but it talked about if anyone lacks wisdom and i had i had no wisdom i I didn't even understand probably what wisdom was, you know, when you're in high school and you have no exposure whatsoever, but you're watching these people. In fact, I I thought, how do they do that? They just open the Bible. Somebody mentions a a scripture and they go, and they're there. I thought, that's like a magic trick. And I remember those words. It's like a magic trick. How do they do that? Well, all it is, is because see, I, I thought, well, there are no tabs, no tabs. And so how do you know where you're going? After a while, when you find, oh, this is a source of wisdom, this is for you for your life, then it becomes very familiar. And you can put little, well, whatever these little flags are like this, you know, you can, you can put those in your Bible if you wish, or you can use, um, I used to do uh, just... Uh, in fact, I, I said to the pastor, uh, I said, how do you, how do you mark a Bible? So that you, and he said, I use paper clips. <laughs> and I thought, paper clips. Genius. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then, of course, I, then I found out, oh, you can mark in your Bible. So these are very rudimental, the rudimentary things so that then what's special to you, you can come back to. And then you see, oh, look at that, that's yellow. And, and uh, I find that I love to see what I've marked at times because it would mean so much to me. And there will be certain key passages that will be very, very helpful for us all. So I'm just thankful for the way you have responded, Crystal, to the Lord. To, and you, you tackle the tough, tough topics like even as you were talking about domestic violence, the the sad thing is there's inaccurate information that people believe and they believe it. In other words, you can take scripture unknowingly out of context and then be subject to domestic violence. Uh, Since you mentioned it, I never forget, I was in my 20s and there was a... um, My mother had a secretary and we were, I think she might've been a year younger than me, but in in her twenties. And, and she said, June, would you please go visit my mother? I, I, I really need you. She needs help. And I'm thinking, what do I know for, to help a mother? And I'm thinking I was a youth director at the time. And, uh, and she said, please, please do this. So I, said okay so I got the address and I drove there and 
I went to the door and she was, uh, she, oh, please come in. I said, what would you like to talk about? And then she described how her husband, well, he was a music evangelist and he insisted that they swing. Now that doesn't mean you sit on a front porch swing. That we're talking about changing sexual partners. Right. And she said, no, no, I, no. And he, then he said, the Bible says, wives submit to your husbands. You have to do this. And she said, I, no, I can't. She said, you, you call yourself a Christian. You're not a Christian if you won't submit because the Bible says wives submit to your husbands. And I'm listening to her. I'm thinking, what, what did she do? Finally, she said after a badgering over and over, and she said, I am a Christian and I do believe in the Bible and I want to do what God wants me to do. So she said, finally, I gave in. And she said, I feel like I'm this high, literally my feet sit, sitting on a dime, my feet dangling still in the air. I feel that small. I thought, what a description. I said, well, I understand that you want to do what God says, but the Bible actually says right before wives submit to your husbands, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. So he needs to submit to you also. And if you did not feel it was right in God's sight, then you had the right to say no, because the Bible also in the 10 commandments says, do not commit adultery. Exactly. And she did not know she had the right to say no. In fact, I said, and three verses later, the Bible says, this is Ephesians 5, uh, 22 initially, but then three verses later, it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he should be willing to die for you, not you die at his hands. Yeah. And of course, it totally, she, she, and of course, she was weeping now. I said, but you can't help what you don't know. And God understands. And you got it actually to reminds me last night, my husband and I went to Walgreens, like towards the, it was late. It was like nine 30 at close to 10. And I was in the store and I was going to run in and he sent me a text and said, some crazy guy just walked in. I thought he was talking about himself. Cause I saw him. I thought he was joking. And he actually said, some guy was like yelling and cussing in the car. And he came in he was like, really like, you know, acting erratic. And, and later he said, Crystal, I came in because I was worried you would get hurt. Like he put himself in harm's way because of how much he loved me and wanted to protect me. Yes. That's what God calls husbands to do. And having, you know, that's like, we're now getting into the whole spiritual abuse thing. Like what are those, what like spiritual abuse is using manipulative tactics. You kind of talk about it in your book, like manipulation, coerciveness, um, trying to remember what all they were, but these tactics and some of the ones that I've seen that have done great harm to my clients is they want to, the tactic is to get the victim to do what they want them to do, not leading them to what Christ wants them to do, but what they want them to do. It could be a husband. It could be a pastor. It mm -hmm. could be, I've heard people say that the pastor you know, can't get enough people to work in children's ministry. So he uses these manipulative tactics to make other people feel guilty mm -hmm. from the pulpit. <laughs> and that is tremendously harmful. Um, also the, and then they'll say, well, the Bible tells us to just forgive. You should just be forgiving me. I've had, you know, parents say this to me when their, their adult child is sharing their hurt, mm -hmm. but what about forgiveness? And I'm like, forgiveness is a, we're going to talk about forgiveness, but we also need to talk about the hurt, right? Um, God told me to tell you, I've seen this one recently, like God told me to tell you to go home and live with a, a perpetrator. God told me to tell you that you are supposed to, you know, volunteer for this position. 
And I'm like, I don't know about you, but I've never told, said the words to another client or person. God told me to tell you. The only time I tell them what God says is when it comes straight from God's word. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be careful though, if they take it out of context, because you can use a scripture, not you, but the abuser, the person who a spiritual abuser will use scripture out of context. Like they'll say, well, where two or three are gathered, you know, then it's like you, that's what you get, what, whatever you pray for. But the context of that is church discipline. It isn't you pray and you ask for whatever you want and you get it. So many times people don't know what the context is. But I, I think what you've been describing is, is a, a huge issue by virtue of those who want to do what God wants them to do. And that's exactly yeah. what I've seen is there's these, you know, primarily women, sometimes men, but I see that their heart is so like, they want to be in God's will. They are so tender. They don't, they don't even like, I've had people, women sit on my office who feel so much shame and disappointment. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you don't see what God sees. I see what God sees. I see an amazing, beautiful, kind-hearted, selfless woman who's like just in a really tough position, right? Like I always tell my clients, if you could just see what God sees right now, you're seeing yourself through the eyes of the perpetrators, through the eyes of the people over the years who've hurt you. But if you could see what God his, I don't know, I like the movie, The Shack. And one of the things that God says to Mac in the movie is I'm especially fond of you. And so I love that. Like, I think growing up and hearing, I love you is one thing, but hearing, I like you is even more powerful. Like, you know, I'm mom, I'm supposed to love my kids, but I make it a habit several times a week to just say, you know what? I really like you. I like who you are. Mm -hmm. I think that you're really great. (laughs) I actually just told my daughter, I'm especially fond of you. She goes like, what does fond mean? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, you you brought up something that uh, when we are reading something in the Bible and at the wives submit to your husbands, just because of what you said earlier, um, if that person is violent and we, we started with domestic violence, what do you do? Do you just keep submitting? Or where in the Bible does it say that you should be somebody's punching bag or treated wrongly treated which is another tactic um you are called to suffer for christ right like uh, that's a different kind of suffering that we're called you've got to yeah you know to and and so it's learning how do we answer those questions when people want to just take okay wife submit to your husband that i have a right to treat you however I wish. No, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 24, do not make friends with a hot tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. So write down that scripture if you don't know it, because you're going to not only be able to use it for yourself at times, but you could especially help someone else. That's Proverbs, the book on wisdom, Proverbs 22, 24. Do not associate with one easily angered. So some people feel guilty because they think, oh, I just don't feel I can be with this husband. And yet I'll just say, do you want to be biblical? Oh, yes, yes. Well, the Bible says do not associate with one easily angered. So when there's anger out of control, uh, the Bible is very clear. In fact, Proverbs 19, 19, that's another great scripture. It's kind of easy to remember too, because it's two 19s in a row, you know, Proverbs 19, 19. Um, Do not make friends with the hot tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered and a hot tempered man must pay the penalty. Must pay the penalty. A hot tempered man must pay the penalty. If you rescue him, you're just going to have to do it again. In other words, it's it's a cycle. That's what is called the cycle 
of abuse. And what is typical in domestic violence uh, is this. There's the agitated stage where the abuser, it, it, it's little things, would blow up at little things. And it doesn't have to be big at all. And, you know, he's blaming her and she buys into the lie that it's all your fault. She said, well, if I just do it better, I've just got to find a better way to, uh, you know, surely I can figure this out, how I can appease him. But, you know, then there's, it moves to the acute stage. And that's like a volcano where the pressure becomes so strong that uh, he erupts uh, and gives full vent to his rage. Now, what do you do there? Um, well, typically she will retreat. Uh, and then it's the third A. I said a, a, agitated, acute. Here's the third A, the apologetic stage. Oh, and then sometimes it's called the honeymoon phase. Now, this is not all people, all, all abusers in, in domestic violence, but he appears to be humble and hopeful. You know, the, this villainous person turns supposedly virtuous, but it's like gifts. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I'll never do it again. And you hear all these promises. His aim, though, is to win you back so that you won't leave him, so that you will be still under his control. And the sad thing is these episodes become more frequent. So there's a vast difference between remorse, being sorry, and people can be sorry that they did what they did. But repentance is very different. Repentance is like if you're driving a car and you're going this way, it's a change of mind with a change of direction. Now you're turning around, it's a turnaround. And so, you can regret some things you've done because you see the consequences of the fear or the pull, pushing away, being, being fearful. So th this is why it's so important to realize that wonderful passage in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow. See, there's a difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to regret but worldly sorrow mm, brings death. Worldly sorrow brings death. You know, it's not going to work. So there has to be a repentance before God and where there is a change of mind with a change of direction. And then that person has the choice of literally allowing the Lord to change them inside out and then the other person, the victim of the domestic violence has a choice. And I just say, wait, wait to see if there is true change. Because uh, I, I remember one time there was a gal, I was teaching singles and uh, she called me one day and she said her husband had uh, knocked her to the floor and put her his knee on her back and he was trying to, he, she said, I felt he was breaking my back, but he'd already thrown her against the cabinets. And so she had permanent eye injury. And I said, did you go to the doctor? Did you go? And she said, did they, and I said, did they take pictures? And they, she said, yes. And, but she had a daughter and this was a marriage. And I actually did not feel good about this marriage because it, it came into the singles area. Uh, she was already there, sweet, sweet. And I thought, you know, I just don't like the attitude he had. And, but they got, they got married. But she had to make a decision. She had a nine-year-old daughter. What? And the daughter was watching all of this violence take place. And so she separated. And I, I said, you have a right to separate. Uh, that I, I don't, have, I, I, I let the Lord tell someone what they need to do regarding divorce, but, but in yeah, regard to separating, I said, this is, because um, now the, the daughter is traumatized 
And so he appeared at my front door. He said, I'm going to report you to and whatever, you know, he was just blowing, just angry because I had suggested that she move out of harm's way. And um, nine months later, he came back and he was in an alcoholic program and you're supposed to go and confess to the people you, you've wronged. And, um, but, but the point is, um, she, because she was willing to separate, then he finally went for help because he was an alcoholic. Initially, he told me, oh, I don't have an alcohol problem, I'm, you know, but he, he wasn't even in touch with reality of, in regard to himself or would not admit it. So, you know, it, it's vital that we not just stay uh, and now I'm going to say this, you say, well, but what about Jesus? Jesus escaped many times in the Bible until it was time for him to be the sacrificial lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Then he submitted to abuse to literally be crucified. But that's why he said, you don't take my life from me. I give my life as a ransom for many. So this, the norm is not, oh, you're, you're just supposed to um, literally take whatever violence anyone uh, causes toward you. No, there's not one time the word violence is ever, ever used in a positive way. It's bring to an end your violence and make the righteous secure.